Hello, welcome back to another episode of Up Next in Commerce. Today, I get to chat with Michael Geller, who's the president of e-commerce and digital at Newell Brands. Newell has a portfolio of companies. We're talking well-known brands, Sharpie, Crock-Pot, Food Saver, Elmer's Glue, Graco, the list goes on. I think they're almost at 100 brands. So with so many brands and so many potential touch points for cross-promotion and cross-selling, how is Michael and his team handling this challenge? We talk about all that and more on this episode. So enjoy the episode with Michael Geller. Before we jump into the interview, I want to give a quick shout out to our partners, Salesforce Commerce Cloud, who helped make this podcast possible. You can learn more about Salesforce Commerce Cloud by visiting salesforce.com slash commerce. All right, let's jump into it. Hey there, and welcome back to Up Next in Commerce. I'm your host, Stephanie Postles, CEO at Mission. Today on the show, I'm super excited. We have Michael Geller, who currently serves as the president of e-commerce and digital at Newell Brands. Michael, welcome to the show. Hi, good morning. Thanks for coming on. So. Everyone always knows I'd like to start with a little bit of background before we dive into your current work. And you have a really impressive one. You've gone from Amazon to Quidzy to Pepsi and now Newell. And I was hoping you can kind of highlight your journey a bit so people get to know you. Uh, sure. Yeah, I uh, I consider myself a tech guy from the beginning. Um, studied computer science. I was always kind of a geeky kid. Um, and after college, uh, basically committed to myself, I would never work for a company. I would only be an entrepreneur and uh, was able to start luckily two companies kind of out of college and then out of business school, uh, but then uh, fell into kind of the corporate world accidentally uh, and ended up going through a series of smaller companies and then ended up, as you said, at Amazon uh, for a long time. Uh, so I had like almost 20 years of just kind of really technology heavy background. And then uh, six-ish years ago, uh, a friend of mine uh, joined PepsiCo to lead their e-commerce group and needed some help there. And it was a big shift to go to a place that was a non-tech kind of DNA company, mm -hmm. but it had a, a great run there. And that was really interesting. And when this opportunity at Newell came out to came up to kind of do the same thing there to kind of help uh, elevate some of the digital and e-commerce functions, that was a, a really interesting thing. So I'd say uh, uh, going back to my original promise to myself, uh, what I realized was it wasn't so much that I didn't want to work for anybody else. It was more that I just wanted to be inventing and doing new things and creating change. And that's the common theme throughout all these different roles has been either uh, creating something, fixing something, building something, uh, transforming something. That's that's the kind of stuff that's really been most exciting for me. Yeah, that's awesome. So what were the first two companies that you built out of college? Because to me, I'm already impressed just by that. I'm like, that's some uh, that's goals right there. So the the uh, right out of college, I started a very early streaming media technology company. Oh, what um, year was that? It was ninety five, so a long time early ago. Early to the game. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and actually, what the interesting part is, at that time, we were building technology to stream high resolution images and three D images of products for online catalogs. So it was early before e commerce was even a word. Yeah. It was online catalogs, and so we were doing these things for very early websites which for those of you who have any tenure here, like we were trying to figure out how to get high resolution images over 14.4 modems. So really, really slow, but this is before broadband, before high-speed internet. Yeah. So that was that was a really interesting thing, but that that actually was the beginning of kind of my quote unquote e-commerce journey was looking at content from, from an e-commerce perspective and trying to figure out how to improve that so that consumers can get a similar experience offline as online. So that was, that was uh, I did that for a few years. Uh, we built a company, but luckily sold the company. And then oh. I went to business school and Who'd then you after, sell it to? Uh, so actually I sold it to John Scully, uh, John Scully, oh, okay. who, just a small name, you know, no big deal. <laughs> well, what? So, <laughs> yeah. So actually the really funny story about that was John Scully, um, who just for those who don't know, was, was president of PepsiCo and then was CEO of Apple for a long time. And then he became an investor at some point and he ended up buying this company that, that we started and, you know, the story went from there, but when we when he bought the company, he was telling us all these stories about his life at PepsiCo. And I was like, ha 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 ha, I'll never work for a company like that. And 20 years later, I ended up at PepsiCo, which was kind of a funny also oh, turnaround story. And so then you're in business school and you start another company afterwards? I started another company. I, I, I unfortunately graduated business school exactly the wrong time, just as the dot-com bubble was bursting. Mm -hmm. And I was still pig-headed about kind of trying to start a company. Uh, I ended up realizing very quickly that we there was no way to raise money in that environment. So uh, a partner and I, we decided to bootstrap a company or try to bootstrap a company. Mm -hmm. uh, I was living in LA at the time 
And we realized that there was a, an opportunity for high-speed internet access in multi-million dollar homes. They, they were too far to get, for a bunch of reasons, to get internet access. And we found an ability to do satellite, two-way satellite internet access. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up building this company to bootstrap it. We got access, a license to sell this two-way satellite system back in, this is like 2000, some 2001. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did that for a while, which gave me access to a lot of really amazing homes and kind of just celebrity homes was really yeah. interesting. But I effectively became the cable guy because we were just like installing these things. Uh, did that for a while. It just, we, we were able to make a, like a nice small business out of it, but not nothing that was a hockey stick. And then it's, and then uh, at some point we decided to to shift. And like I said, that's when I got my first real job. <laughs> Your first real job. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you've been very ahead on a lot of things that are, you know, people are still trying to figure out even to today. You were just doing it a long time ago. Do you ever feel that way where you're like, that was my idea or I had that idea <laughs> 10 years ago? Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, yes, that, that does come up. But I think that's a lot of people in the technology space who are thinking about new ideas. Like you have a thousand ideas, yeah. 10 of them at some point are going to come to fruition. And you can always say, yeah. I thought of that. But yes, I do feel that once in a while. But I don't think I don't think I'm unique in that in that sense. So what drew you to Newell Brands? What was the opportunity that you spotted there? Uh, well, what's what's interesting about Newell Brands is a very uh, old, you know, tenure long, long lasting company with a lot of established phenomenal brands. Uh, mm -hmm. There are no other companies like it that have got uh, a well in the space of let's say durable, semi semi durables, right? Not consumables there really isn't anyone else that's got the breadth of brands and the size and the scale that Newell Brands has. Yep. Uh, Newell Brands had uh, kind of a tumultuous history up and down over the past bunch of years. And uh, I, when I was reached out to about the role, uh, it was basically, the, it was told to me, which is true, that the company was in a bit of a turnaround. Basically, you know, most of the management is, is new within kind of two-ish years, two and a half years, something like that. At the time, it was around two years. The company was in the process of doing a turnaround and, and they were already like well out of the way of the biggest risk of the turnaround, but there was still a lot of stuff to do to, to really take the company that was candidly on the precipice however many years ago and into one, into one that really had a lot of growth. And I looked at it and said, there's a lot of assets here. Um, the brands are phenomenal. There's a real opportunity for scale and, and it feels like there's a lot of low hanging fruit. So that was interesting. It didn't, it, it helped that I didn't have to move. So that was also got me to take the phone call. Um, but then, uh, but then once I understand, uh, stood again, like, the, the other thing I'll say about Newell Brands, which was interesting, is to the credit of the previous regime, they had invested very early in e-commerce. And actually, I was shocked to learn how uh, big the e-commerce business was and how much it had grown over the past bunch of years and how in some ways well prepared they were for the next round of innovation and the next round of transformation. Um, I'd say that the way they grew into the e-commerce space was very much, uh, and again, I don't mean this in a negative way, but it was brute force. It was through dollars and people, et cetera. It wasn't necessarily through technology or data, et cetera. I thought there was a real opportunity to come in and take this amazing asset of the brands, the amazing asset of the e-commerce work that they had done, candidly, both in Amazon and other pure plays, but also candidly in the D2C space. I was shocked to hear like how significant the D2C business was here and that there was so much opportunity. So that was all very exciting because it felt like real opportunity to uh, similarly transform, grow, do some really interesting things on the back of these phenomenal brands, phenomenal businesses. Yeah. So for anyone who doesn't really know Newell Brands, I'll say I didn't really know there was like that company over top of all the other ones. Can you name some of the top brands within your portfolio or maybe just like 10? I mean, I think there's like yeah, 50 there are, or more. So Newell Brands has, I don't know, 100 brands, something like mm -hmm. that. And they're all household names, you know. So Rubbermaid, uh, Graco Car Seats, Sharpies, Elmer's Glue, uh, Coleman Camping, Marmot, Technical Apparel, uh, Contigo Water Bottles, uh, let's see who, Ball Canning Jars, Calphalon Pots, uh, Oster, Crock Pot, the Blender, <laughs> Crock Pot, right? I mean, so literally dozens and dozens of yeah. brands um, that uh, that everybody knows, right? Almost all of our of our brands are really household, household names. And uh, one of the exercises I did when I first joined was I literally, the day before I started, I went around the house and just took photos of all the new brands I could find in my house. It was a staggering amount. Uh, yeah. I like, it was a you know big collage of of of, uh, of pictures. Yeah, I was doing the same thing after getting the prep doc for this and looking through that and looking around my house and being like, it's everywhere, everything. Like all these brands, I had no idea were newer brands, yeah. and they're all really good brands too. Like sometimes yeah. you see holding companies where you're like, I know two of those brands, and the rest I'm not really sure about. This almost yeah, every single amazing, name. It's, yeah, it's an amazing collection of brands, and I think if you look at the history of the company, like. Mm -hmm. 
there are so many brands over the years, over the decades that have come in or out of the company. So if you look at the brands that have ever been in this, in the umbrella of this company, it's even a bigger list. I mean, it's just amazing. Okay. So when thinking about your first 90 days, what was your plan? Like, what were you like, I'm set out to do this for the first 90? Well, uh, well, the first 90 days was really just assessing, um, the uh, figuring out where we had strength and where we had opportunities and, and kind of reestablishing, uh, in, in my particular role, this is less about e-commerce, but in the role, uh, the, the, the team that I had, in, that I inherited was, uh, had been kind of leaderless for a long time. And so there was just getting, getting to know people, figuring out what existed, trying to reshape, reform a few teams, uh, or start reshaping, reform a few, a few teams at the beginning. That was a lot of what the beginnings was. I was also learning, we've got eight business units, which is a complicated, which is hard because it's, mm -hmm. it's eight different CEOs effectively of, of businesses. And there's a lot of just relationship building there to make sure that I understand what they need. And by the way, their needs from, from my, uh, my team are very different. Uh, you know, let's say car seats is a very highly penetrated online category. It's a very different set of needs than let's say our paper make brands that are pens where the, the penetration is much lower. Mm -hmm. And so, the, you know, or, or, uh, you can think about, a. a uh, a brand like um, like Marmot, right? That category, people are used to buying technical apparel at this point online. Yep. It's just a very different experience to, to buy, sell, market, those types of things than it is to, you know, pick another brand, right? Pick a, mm -hmm. something else that we sell, right? So, so under, there was a lot of just really learning there. Um, and then the first thing was just figuring out, you know, you always start with the foundational stuff. So figuring out where, how are we doing on the foundational work, right? If you think about e-commerce in particular, it's really around the consumer, right? There are two things to really look at all the time. It's consumer number one. And the second thing is to make sure you've got is data, right? Making sure that the data that you have to run the business is accessible, usable, digestible, available, et cetera. And so those are the two real areas I started looking at to figure out, do we have that? There's, there's, there's a, obviously a third thing, which is important in a company like ours, which is around the customer. So the customer for us, meaning the retailers. So the Amazons, the Walmarts, Targets, et cetera, you know, Bye Bye Baby for our car, for our baby brands, Costco, you keep going, the list keeps on. Uh, that's also a very, very uh, important uh, place to look, but, but looking first from a consumer lens and seeing how are we doing from a consumer perspective across all of our direct, direct and indirect channels. Um, that was the first thing to look. And so there's the, the looking at, how does our content look online? How are, is our, is our copy good? Are we getting the right, how are our reviews, right? What are people saying? How is, how is our experience from a uh, in stock and other, and other things, right? The things that at the end of the day, consumer can see is the first place that I, I started looking and started identifying opportunities there to focus. And then, and then from there you look at, like I said, data is really important because that's the thing that's going to drive any decisions and more importantly, any test and learns or any improvements. So that's the second focus is trying to figure out how to make sure, and that we we have the data available, and, and again, I inherited a lot of really strong, both people and and assets, and so trying to figure out what we have, how to put it together in different ways. Do we have to make changes or not? That's that was a lot of the beginning phase. I mean, how did you shift the team's mindset? I know you, before you said it was a lot of like you know put headcount to it, brute force, like make this work, and it did work. But how did you shift their mindset to then start thinking, okay, what can we do to automate this? Like, how can we actually organize this in a more technical way than it has been done before? Uh, so it's, I've only been here nine months, so it's still early. So, I, so um, uh, the approach, so first of all, change is tough and, and change in a big organization is tough. And especially in an organization like ours, which is by design in a matrix organization. Um, and so you, you, it's hard to come into a new company and kind of, th you know, yeah. pound your fists and say, this is the way it has to be done. Uh, the approach that uh, I've been taking and encouraging the team to take uh, has been one of, ex of experimenting. So basically, you know, come up with a hypothesis, something to be done differently. And then instead of trying to convince somebody to do it, you know, that's the way we have to do it. Just say, Hey, can we test it for a month to two months, three months and see how, see if we can try it a different way. And worst case we revert, right? It's like, it's pretty low risk decision. Yeah. It's not, a, there's not a lot, large commitment and it's just a way to learn. And that approach, I think broadly, we've been able to apply it to a lot of different things. Uh, and we've been able to find some areas where we found some experiments that work, <laughs> found some areas where experiments don't work. But that approach, I think, has been one that's just been a little bit lower risk um, and, uh, and easier to get kind of the, the, the feedback loop, right? You spend more time actually, if you, it's easier to come up with a hypothesis, get some agreement to do a test, 
and then do it and then build the data set based on a, the actual results of the test rather than the, the other approach, which is to yep. spend six months arguing about what's the best way to do A, B, and C, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then do a big band, big, you know, big reveal. And then it turns out that it, you know, may, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. And so, yep. um, you know, that's, that's broadly the approach I've been trying to take here with the team. Um, and like I said, we've seen some successes, we've made some changes as a result of that. Um, and we've also, like I said, we've seen some failures, which is also yeah. you know, really good. So how did you go about thinking through like what tech to implement? I mean, I'm thinking about all these different brands, all this different data, like, are you bringing them all onto one tech stack? Was there kind of a solution that you already had in mind? It feels like there's a lot of things you'd have to tackle at once with yeah. all these different streams of, you know, revenue coming in. Uh, so, uh, again, I, I was blessed in some sense that some of that work had been done already. Uh, there was, a, there was a, so two big decisions that were made that before my time, one was, uh, to consolidate some of the, the Amazon team into a, into a single team that crossed all the business units. Mm -hmm. And that I think has been very uh, strong reason for success on that channel. Uh, and the other big decision was related to the direct to consumer businesses. We had a crazy amount of websites and, and direct to consumer, you know, sites across the world. Um, and there was a decision again, predated me to get them all onto one tech stack. Mm -hmm. uh, that and that was basically 95% complete by the time I joined. So that yeah. was, I mean, that was that, that credit to other people. Uh, that was that was really really great. So the basics of that, I think, um, were good. Now the problem with that is that you know you, it's it's very hard to be nimble and agile and responsive to to all these different brands when you're in a single stack. But but it's also there's also some pros to being on a single stack, and so that's now now that we've got everybody on the stack. Now the next part is figuring out how do we how do we take the um, you know the single basically product for all of our brands and and figure out how do I how to personalize them or individualize them for the for the particular brands and particular consumer segments. Mm -hmm. That's that's the next step now. Got it. if you don't mind me asking, what the what is what tech stack are you using? What software are you using behind the scenes to be able to personalize uh, so it? It's, it, you can imagine it's a, it's a conglomeration of lots of different products. I think it's a Salesforce background, back, uh, backbone. Got it. Okay. Well, that's our uh, sponsor on the show. So, hey, shout out to them then. <laughs> that's awesome. So when it comes to the kinds of data coming in, I mean, some of the products are kind of similar. Like what are you seeing when, you know, you're looking at these different business units and products? Like are you seeing some themes happening over the past nine months where you're like, oh, I'm starting to see some trends and ways to maybe like, organize things differently or cross promote each other. There's a long corporate history, which I think led to it, but I think the, the, the business units, uh, this is more corporate structure rather than technology or data. I think the business units have been building their brands uh, independent, more independently uh, historically. And there hasn't been as much opportunity to do cross sell. Uh, and, and if you think about like the, the ultimate consumer, the mom, right? Uh, you think about, let's say a mom is buying a infant car seat that tells us a lot about her. We probably, if you think about the breadth of products, right? That mom likely is going to need, you know, kitchens, you know, tools or or for their for her kitchen, pots, pans, yeah. you know, ball jars, like food saver, vacuum sealing, like lots of things. She probably needs, if she has older kids, might need some school supplies, Elmer's mm -hmm. or Paper Mate or things like that. Uh, she may like. There's so many things we know about her just from that one purchase or one yeah. just one piece of data that we probably can cross sell. That's a massive opportunity for us. We have not, we have not, we've just scratched the surface in terms of opportunity there. Um, now, we do have the data to be able to do that. And candidly, we increasingly have the platforms to be able to do some of that cross sell, whether it's through our direct to consumer sites or whether it's through some of our retail partners. Um, I think that's a big opportunity. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. that's, that's, no, it, that's it a huge, does. huge opportunity for us. I've always kind of thought about that when, I mean, I've bought three car seats at this point. And every time I'm like, you essentially know the next 18 years of my life. Correct. Like you should be just, you know, help me out here at, at age three. I'm going to need this when they're five. I'm going to need this probably. And we know there is a lot of data that we know about consumers um, and we increasingly have to use it better because uh, again, just within the brands even, right. Think about the, the mom who buys an infant car seat. We actually know when she's ready for the next size or when she's yep. looking for a high chair or when she should be looking for a, a, a jogging stroller or, or, you know, whatever, all these different things. Uh, with that's just kind of within a particular set of brands, right? Mm -hmm. Cross brand is even is so much a bigger opportunity, I think, than than we've taken advantage of yet, or at least in the recent in the recent history. 
Yeah. Are there any experiments right now you are kind of having your team work on when it comes to personalization or trying to utilize the data in a different way or a new way? Well, uh, so a couple of, I mean, none of it I would say is rocket science, right? So I'm going to say things and I don't, they don't sound incredibly sexy, but I think they're really important. So like one experiment that we did, which was very successful was, and it, again, it seems obvious was we sell these food saver, um, you know, appliances so you can vacuum seal, mm -hmm. you know, food, et cetera. Um, and then we sell the consumables, right? The bags and those other, the other products that go along with it, right? So figuring out how to use tools like retargeting and other tools like that to figure out how to like remind people like, hey, you may be running out of the consumables, the bags, et cetera. Like you, we know you have a device, right? That, that seems like an obvious thing. Putting a little bit of focus on those types of activities as opposed to a broader, just, you know, food saver marketing activity mm -hmm. proved very successful. Again, I don't think that's rocket science necessarily, but I think it was just a little bit of focus. We were able to convince folks who just hadn't done, hadn't thought that way before to try something. And then they were like, oh, this has a good return and it's yep. great for the consumer and it's good for the product. That, that'd be an example. Um, we're, I think you'll see us more, especially coming this year, like especially later in the year, we'll, you'll see more of us trying to do multi-brand type of things. Um, one of the opportunities we have is uh, with, especially with our retail partners is to leverage the scale of their traffic to try to do, you know, to try to do uh, cross brand more, you know, higher cross brand selling basically. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, and this is something I did uh, with the team very successfully at PepsiCo, is we realized that you know if you're if you're on a a Walmart or a Target or an Amazon, and you know you there's tens or hundreds of millions of sessions going on in there, and there there you know ten or hundreds of millions of products on there. Like, how do you get people? How do you get consumers to see your products? And so by by trying to attract them with a variety of brands that we think target them, the likelihood of of consumers coming in through that to like a store within a store of our ecosystem, of our ecosystem brands is probably a, a way to be very efficient with, with marketing spend. It's probably a very good consumer experience and it, it makes a choice kind of the selection a little easier. And so for us, it can be a very effective way to do that. I saw that at, with PepsiCo, that was a very effective uh, mechanism we used. Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't done it here yet too much at, at Newell, but that's something we're, we're exploring for this year. So what are best practices when thinking about Amazon and kind of having your own like custom store experience? How do you go about building that to get awareness around certain products and then bring them into the ecosystem? How would you advise a company right now to think about that and really tap into Amazon like you did at PepsiCo? Right. So the advantage that both I had at PepsiCo and candidly have at Newell is one that I think is pretty unique. So there are probably 10 companies in the world that I think can use the same strategy okay. um, in order. It's basically uh, it's a strategy that works really well for companies that have scale. Right. And meaning scale of brands, scale of of, you know, revenue, et cetera, that that um, and, and scale of products that hit a particular consumer segment. So, uh, you know, in, in the PepsiCo world, right, it was it was uh, snacks and, and beverages that those went together pretty well. And so we were able to kind of make events that were like a snack and beverage event of some sort, whether it was around a prime day or a holiday or whether it was just, you know, bespoke. Mm -hmm. And we were able to say, you know, get your snacks and, and, and beverages and get people into the PepsiCo store within a store on, on whatever retail platform we were on. Mm -hmm. um, I think the same thing is true at, at Newell where we can pay, potentially do things, again, either with retail events like a holiday or a prime day or whatever, or we can do it potentially on our own, right? Create a some kind of a mom centered or a family centered or an outdoors center for some of our outdoor gear or et cetera. We can potentially create these effectively events that people might come into the event because it's an interesting event. Mm -hmm. And then once they're in there, the, the selection of products is, you know, the products we think fit that that curated segment of consumer. Yeah. Um, those that kind of thing is what you can do. Now, if you're if you if you're a company that's only selling one, two, three products, that's very hard to do, right? In our case, that's where I think we have an opportunity. And candidly, that word scale, I think, is the important one. That's and that going back to your first question about what was interesting about Newell, right? It's this ability to we have scale. We have to figure out how to be how to leverage that scale in a way that's really again consumer oriented and drives uh, growth and profit for the business. Yep, got it. How are you thinking about this year, 2022? I mean, are there any trends right now that you've seen when it comes to you know people shopping on Amazon versus going D to C versus going to retail partners? I mean, you have access to so many different brands. I'm sure you can see a lot. So what are you all seeing behind the scenes? Well, I, I, okay. So the, the obvious things are what everybody knows, right? Where uh, there's all these you know COVID laps, right? A year ago, uh, 
people went, you know, people, the, the online adoption went crazy uh, once we hit COVID and we're, we're, we're kind of starting to lap that. Um, or actually, I should say two years ago, right? People were crazy. And so we're starting to lap with starting to feel more like the normal, the normal world, kind of. So that's one thing that we're obviously looking at and trying to figure out what's what's, uh, you know, how sticky is the e-commerce consumer, right? We saw massive, massive growth in e-commerce over the last two years. How sticky are they? And and this past year, we've seen, you know, there for a while, there were people going back to stores candidly faster than we thought. Mm-hmm. Now people are back online. Uh, I don't think we know, right? Nobody can predict what's going to happen, but but that's going to be, that's something we're in, watching very closely. I think for us, the other ones that are big impact to the company and to the world actually is all the supply chain disruption. Uh, that's That's actually affected a lot because, we spend we spend probably more time than we'd like to figuring out how to uh, optimize the the inventory that is constrained now because we have all these disruptions in the, in the supply chain and figuring out where does it go and so uh, that one I think is actually I mean hopefully we'll figure out how to continually improve on that in, into this year but that's a wild card a, a bit because um, we lost some ability to look at the data because we were artificially um, demand was high but we weren't able to necessarily supply as much as the, as the demand was in a lot of cases. And so it's hard to see, that signal is gonna be hard to, to, to read. So that's gonna complicate things a little bit for the next little while in terms of trends from my perspective. But uh, as, as you know, the supply chain improves, which looks like it's improving, uh, we'll you know, hopefully be able to kind of get to something more normal, be able to see it. Um, and then obviously the third thing that, that we're just macro that everybody's looking at again is also just what's going to happen with inflation this year and what's going to be the impact and candidly, um, what it's going to do to demand, right? Mm-hmm. As, as prices, you know, likely go up or, or are going up, are consumers going to change their behavior or not? Um, mm-hmm. that's something that, you know, again, I'm not sharing any secrets here, right? In the industry or in the, in the world, you can see demand hasn't gone down with prices going up so far. But that at some point will probably change. It'll be interesting to see when that when that does change. Yeah, I was listening to an interesting podcast a few days ago, and it was about inflation and how right now consumers may be feeling um, kind of like artificially richer than they are, and they're spending at rates maybe that they shouldn't. And so that, of course, is making you know some people nervous of like, okay, is spending going to decrease over the coming year as inflation goes higher? And um, yeah, that's a tricky one to watch yeah. though. And, and also, it's out of writing. all people's hands. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, we, these are all the things we're watching. I don't have a prediction here, but mm-hmm. but these are some of the key things. And again, it all everything comes down to the consumer. I'll just keep saying that, right? It's all yeah. about what the consumer wants is, you know, and, and the, the great thing about e-commerce, whether, again, whatever channel you're in, is it's incredibly data rich. So, and it's also the feedback loops are very quick. So it doesn't take, you know, in, 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 in a traditional brick and mortar world where you're, you know, you're shipping product to a, uh, to a retail outlet, they're putting on the shelf, it sits on the shelf forever long, and then it gets bought the data. It takes a long time, but there's a long lag there in, in the, you know, the world of e-commerce, we're getting very real time information on what's happening with price, what's happening with the consumer, what's happening with supply, what's happening with out of stocks, like all these different things. The, the data is so rich that, you know, it's not, it doesn't, Again, we're still a minority of the business is still e-commerce sales, mm-hmm. but the data is so rich that it should be able to impact and, and, and uh, inform the, the, the majority of the business that's still brick and mortar base. And mm-hmm. that's where I think we have a lot of opportunity to hopefully move faster and make decisions faster than we ever have you know, in the history. Okay. So the next thing I want to talk about was how you balance your retail versus e-commerce experience. How do you think about creating the perfect you know, customer journey or omni-channel experience for the customer? Yeah, so I think again, uh, it's we're following the consumer, right? So we need to make sure that any consumer touch point is a consumer touch point that's excellent, whether it's on our sites, whether it's through our media, whether it's through our call centers, I mean, whether it's through our warranty replacements, like whether it's through a retail site, a DTC site, any any of these things, right? Uh, from from my perspective, I think that the key thing that I think we're we're evolving to, and this has been an interesting conversation with many of the brands. And many of the brand leaders has been uh, the consumers are are interacting with us in all these different channels, independent of where they shop. And by the way, independent of where they shop might also be different from how they get it fulfilled, right? So, so the it's a lot of this is becoming super decoupled. And so you, you have to think about you know the person who walks into a, a physical store, a Walmart, a Target, a Costco, a wherever. Uh, the way that they got to that physical sale in that particular case may have been through a lot of digital assets. They may have been going to our D2C site 
to review, to, to see, to get product descriptions or check out colors or look at reviews or whatever. They may be, or it could be the opposite. They may be going into the store to touch something and then buy it either directly through us or through another retail outlet. Like, so the, the consumer is, is becoming omnivorous in terms of the way that they're consuming the data and learning about our products and, and interacting with us. And so we need to figure out how to continue to be everywhere that they are. So it's important for us uh, to, to make sure that, you know, the, 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 the experience we have on our direct consumer platforms, the experience we have on the various retail platforms, which by the way, all have different capabilities. But when we think about the sum of that, plus our media, plus our other brand communications is holistically consistent and, and gives the consumer the ability to get whatever information they need, wherever they, wherever they might um, want to consume it. And again, that's independent of potentially where they buy it. And that's also independent of potentially how it gets fulfilled. They might pick it up at the store, they might get it shipped, there might be somewhere, some other way of doing it. Uh, but all of these things effectively become decoupled, but the whole experience becomes the, the consumer experience. And that's the way we have to look at it. Mm -hmm. What does the partnership look like with retail partners? Because that, I mean, they have a big part of making sure that experience works well. And I know you mentioned also having different kinds of partnerships with them. So what does it look like to set up a successful relationship in a way that you can make sure that experience really does work the way that you're explaining it? Yeah, I mean, our retail partners are incredibly important to us, obviously. That's still... Mm -hmm. The majority of our sales are coming through through that channel. Um, the, I mean, there, there's there's fundamentals in terms of just setting up the business relationships so that it, it's it's a win win. So that we're making money, they're making money. We are, we're operationally efficient. I mean, there's all the kind of block and tackle stuff that you would have in any retail relationship. Making sure you know pricing is right, supply chain is right, promotions are right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I think also the uh, the uh, the added the added stuff that we have now is really making sure that, the, again, the consumer experience, we have to work with them continually on the consumer experience, right? They're on our case all the time. Every one of these retailers is on our case to make sure, is your content up? Is your, is your, uh, is your you know, they have scorecards for us as to how well we're doing on all the, what they consider the fundamentals. And candidly, we're pushing the retailers as well to continue to build capabilities that help us do two things. One is get our message out to the consumer in a, in an effective, positive way. And that those Technologies across every retailer have been uh, have been uh, um, evolving over the last ten years, right? From what the detail pages look, what the brand stores look like, what their media platforms look like, et cetera. Um, how offsite, onsite, like all the different things. And then uh, the other part of it, which is the other area we're pushing with the retailers, is around the data access, right? It's in order for us to be, in order for us to make our joint business more effective, we just need to make sure we have the data that allows us to be more effective. So whether that's having more, having faster uh, feedback in terms of problems, uh, better feedback in terms of what the consumer is doing, et cetera, is really important. Obviously, you know, there are privacy concerns, so we're not getting down to, you know, individual consumers and what they did, but the trends and the, uh, the you know, the speed of which we're getting the feedback is really important for us because increasingly we're able to react to that faster and, and speed really matters, right? So the faster we can, the faster we can get the data, the faster we consume the data, the faster we can react to the data, whether it's in something on the supply chain or pricing or, or marketing or promotion or whatever, the better it's going to be for everybody. And so that, that data transfer and data uh, partnership, I think, is something that uh, is also evolving along with some of the other things. Yeah. Cool. Are there any pieces of tech right now that you're geeking out on that are maybe helping in that initiative or helping anything that you're doing day to day where you're like, oh, I'm really excited about this one? new piece of tech that we just stumbled on? Uh, so <laughs> I tend to be boring on that front. Uh, like I, <laughs> okay, I, I like I mean, boring too. <laughs> I, I tend to, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that we're doing, right? There is, on our direct to consumer sites, we're doing a lot of experimentation with, you know, the, the kind of the, sh the shiny object stuff, the mm -hmm. per more personalization uh, of, you know, uh, augmented reality, like all the kind of buzzwordy things that, 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 that kind of exist there. We're testing a lot of that stuff. And some of it is, is proving to be fruitful, some less so. I'll tell you, I think there's still so much opportunity just to improve the fundamentals, just continue to look at the yeah. consumer flow and the consumer funnel. Like, how do we find the consumers? How do we interact with them? And how do we get them to effectively make a purchase, which is candidly what we're in business to do, uh, whether, again, independent of where they do the purchase, that whole funnel. I think there's so much kind of low-hanging fruit just in terms of raw looking at data making small tweaks, iterating, that's really not kind of a, a sexy new technology. It's just pushing the envelope and continuing to push the envelope and figure out what to do. Like the example I said before, the food saver consumables, 
-hmm. retargeting has been around for a long time. It's just a matter of applying it appropriately to the, to the, to the product. There's plenty of technology out there, basic technology out there, uh, to, to help. Um, so we'll see, uh, the, the, the only other place I'd say, I, I think that, uh, there is opportunity and actually I would say it does excite me a lot is around some of the new data science techniques because the 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 issue in a company like ours uh, is we're, we're big and we have a lot of things going on at once and at some point uh, it's very hard to do things manually and optimally and so mm -hmm. having some sort of automation data science AI ML like those kinds of tools to apply to things that people might be able to do manually gives us a lot, again gets a scale that we may not have otherwise again is that is that a sexy new technology no are there new techniques that are coming out every day to do that yes is that exciting i think i think so what are what's maybe an example of a new technique coming out where you're like it could transform something that we've been doing manual for you know 10 years or longer well uh i'd have to think about things that are right now but if you think about let's say the the most obvious one over the last five or 10 years, I think has had massive implications has been uh, the automation of uh, and optimization on paid search and display ads, right? That mm -hmm. just the marketing automation that's happened over the last five or 10 years has been incredibly uh, effective and important and grow the bit. I mean, if you look at like every display, like just within the retail environment, forget a Google, if you just look within the retail environment, the, the growth in those, you know, paid search and display platforms that is because it's effective. How is it effective? It's because they're getting more smarter, continually smarter about targeting the right consumers, getting their bidding right for the ones that are you know, bidded, bidded uh, ad units. Uh, all of the, the behind the scenes mechanisms that are, that are uh, better pinpointing the right ad to the right consumer at the right time is, is doing two things. One is it's, it's let all of us as advertisers, it's making it more effective for us to, and more efficient for us to, to play in that, in that sandbox. But it's also because it's more pinpointed, it's also giving more inventory effectively to everybody, right? So it's actually, it's open, it's, it's, it's uh, growing the pie in multiple different ways. I think that's, that's for me is still something that um, has been very exciting the last five or 10 years. And I think it's gonna be and continue to be a, an area of innovation for the next long while. And some of that's gonna be developed by, you know, some of the retail platforms, some of it's gonna be by a tool or other providers. Some of it's gonna be hopefully innovated by, uh, by folks like us. Yeah, I love it. All right, well, let's move over to the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. This is where I ask you a question and you have a minute or less to answer. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, first, what's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? Focus on the consumer. I love it. What's something you constantly tell your team or remind them of? Uh, we don't have to solve everything. We just have to continue to make incremental improvements. Love it. What's up next on your reading list? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I will say uh, I just read, so it's not what's upcoming, but I just read a great book called Working Backwards um, about Amazon that I thought was actually one of the best, one of the best business books about Amazon that was really not only just telling stories about Amazon, but actually uh, gave some really uh, crisp advice on how to apply some of that to other businesses. Ooh, I'll have to check that one out. Uh, if you were to have a podcast, what would it be about? Uh, uh, I, so, good question. Uh, I actually uh, spent a lot of time, especially the last two years, in kind of home automation, DIY, that kind of stuff. And so, mm -hmm. Um, that whole world is, is like how to automate stuff and, and to make more, you know, make your life more efficient. Those are the areas where I have a lot of like personal passion. And so that could, that could be a fun podcast, I think. Um, yeah, I would definitely say it goes with the trend that's happening around the home yes. improvement. I mean, everyone would be listening to that. Yes. You should start it. We'll find you a sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the last one, uh, what is a favorite memory over the past 10 years that you think about that makes you happy? And it can be personal, it can be business, it can be anything, just something that first pops to your mind. Uh, well, it's, it would be hard to, all, a lot of the memories are personal. I've got, I've got five kids actually. And so mm -hmm. um, the, the times when we've all been able to be together in some more fun, typically on a vacation, either skiing or on the beach, I think those are the areas where I'm like, oh, this is, this is nice, <laughs> relaxing, yep. et cetera, and, and good family time. I love that. 
Well, Michael, thanks so much for coming on the show and joining me. It was a blast. And uh, we'll definitely have to have you back in the future. Where can our listeners find out more about you and Newell Brands? To learn about the brands at Newell, you can go to Newell Brands. Uh, but but uh, you know, check out all of our D2C sites. Uh, Yankee Candles, a really popular one. Uh, Marmot's another good one. Uh, there's several other interesting ones to learn more about our products and brands. Uh, to learn about me, I think you know the typical LinkedIn, et cetera, is probably, probably best. Perfect. Thanks, Michael. If you're looking for the number one platform for all things commerce, there's no better choice. So definitely go check it out at salesforce.com slash commerce.